In the fall of 1966, Marvel Comics desperately wanted to break into show business. Their comics were a phenomenon. Characters like Spider-Man, Hulk, and Thor were quickly becoming household names. But what if they could make that recognition even stronger by utilizing the fairly new medium of television cartoons with a show simply called The Marvel Superheroes? Hi, I'm Stan Lee editor of the Marvel Comics Group of superhero comic magazines. Comic books have been a big business for the past 25 years, and they're bigger than ever today. And we feel we found the proper vehicle for transferring them to the television screen in such a way as to maintain, in fact, to intensify the appeal they now possess, an appeal which has made the Marvel Comics Group the most talked about publishing success of the decade. What Stan means by that is that these cartoons were made cheaply by taking comic art that already existed and barely animating them to clunkily move here and there. The upside to this technique is that you get a cartoon taken directly from comic book art drawn by legends like Jack Kirby. The downside is that these pieces of art were specifically made for static pages of comics, not animation. What looks great on paper doesn't perfectly translate to a television screen. And that's why this series of cartoons, each revolving around a different Marvel character, can look real goofy sometimes. A couple of months ago, I did a massive video about the Captain America cartoon segment from this show, and you all seemed to really enjoy that video, and I could not resist the siren song of these other cartoons. Every single one of them is an absolute nonsensical gem that I can't stop watching. I have stumbled into Loki's forest and his obedient trees are surrounding me. A harmless paper plane touched by my stone palm becomes a lethal weapon. Thor is momentarily stunned by Odin's mighty power blast. What? <sighs> Perfection in every way. I haven't had this much amusement in centuries. Today we're gonna tackle the mighty Thor, and let me tell you something, this show somehow manages to be buck wild chaotic and obnoxiously predictable at the same time. It's completely baffling, and I just, I love it a whole dang bunch. Plus, it's a great time in the algorithm right now to be talking about Loki, who's not only in nearly every single one of these episodes, but in fact, the entire series starts on him instead of Thor, a decision I'm sure Loki would appreciate. <laughs> At last! Now, my Captain America video was nearly an hour long, so I should probably go feed my cat's dinner first, because I suspect we're going to be in for another lengthy analysis. What the heck is going on with this? Okay, that's a little strange, what? Whoever holds this hammer, should their video essays be brief, shall possess the power of Thor, and thus be allowed to leave this room. Ah, oh, dang, Sparta's gonna starve. Well, hey, how are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and over the next few months, we're gonna be dissecting each one of these cartoons. Thor, Hulk, Iron Man, we've already done Captain America, so that just leaves Namor, despite what's good for my health. If you wanna follow along with this journey of analyzing these hard-defined cartoons and learning some real-world history along the way, then subscribe and hit that bell so we can watch through these together, like we're friends. We're not friends though. Oh, also I should say I'm taking a short break from accepting sponsors on my videos for obvious reasons if you watched my last video. So to make up for that, oh boy, I'd love to convince you to buy some of my things. I got shirts, I got pins, I got mugs, stickers, rad looking posters that you can even get signed by me if you want. It's all available at nerdstinkstore.com, link in the description. You can also get a discount on all of my merch by supporting me on Patreon if that's a thing that you would like to do. I'm sorry for plugging so hard at the top of this episode, but there is an image of me floating around the internet saying how much I love money, so you, 
You, under, you get it, you understand. Nerdsingstore.com, buy my things, please. But okay, we gotta keep this video short, so enough with the context. No more history and no more of those side notes that I did in my last video that took up most of the runtime. We're diving right in to actual content with The Mighty Thor, episode one. Cross the rainbow bridge of Asgard, where the booming heavens roar. You behold in breathless wonder the god of thunder, mighty Thor. <sighs> the theme song for this show is just so good. And that reminds me, side note one, who wrote the theme songs? Sorry, buddy, a lot of you wanted me to talk more about this in my last video, but the theme songs for all of these shows are so good. Instantly catchy earworms, and they were all written by songwriter Jacques Urbain, who was, at the start of his career, breaking into composing for television. He met directly with Stan Lee for the job, but almost didn't get it, because he told Stan that he had no idea what Marvel was or who any of these superheroes were. Stan was shocked and almost walked out, but Urban assured him. Mr. Lee, I know what you're thinking. And if I were in your shoes, I'd be thinking the same thing. But just get me some source material, one or two comic books, and three days later, I will have songs that are so terrific, you will wish you'd written them yourself. Urban, whose name I'm sure I've been mispronouncing this entire time, I'm here tonight with Jack Urban, walked out of the meeting with a handful of comics as research, and he was tasked with creating seven songs for the cartoon series. But wait a minute, seven songs? There's only five characters. Cap, Hulk, Iron Man, Namor, and Thor. I can't believe I almost forgot Thor. It's the whole, this, that's what this video is about. What happened to those other two songs? What, are, what were they for? That's a great question that I wrote and pretended you asked. One of the other songs was the intro to the show as a whole. You see, these don't pop up on the DVDs or most digital copies I've found online, but the Marvel superheroes show had its own theme song before the character specific theme songs. Its goal was to introduce the heroes even further. They are Kane, striking superhero, chains to Viking superhero, a humbling and real swing and shield, clinging superhero. They're the latest, they're the greatest, ultimate superheroes, the Marvel superheroes have The seventh song was the theme for the Merry Marvel Marching Society, which was basically Marvel's fan club. The song was sent to members of the fan club on a now extremely rare and hard to find 45 vinyl record. And yes, I have looked on eBay for it, but I don't have $600 to spend on frivolous purchases like that. So you gotta support me on Patreon because it's the only way I can get these. I think at one point the song was also used as the end credit sequence for the Marvel superheroes show as well. I was able to find at least a clip of that. Stand a little straighter, walk a little prouder, be an innovator, clap a little louder, joke around the crater, we can show you how to, and when will you be then? You belong, you belong, you belong, you belong to the Merry Marvel Marching Society. As for the character-specific theme songs, Urban captured the essence of each hero in five distinct songs that lasted less than 20 seconds each. Here with Thor, for example, he created a theme song that feels fantastical and magical, like you're going on a wondrous journey. Cross the rainbow bridge of Asgard, where the booming heavens roar. It rules. All of the theme songs do. And we're gonna talk about each one of them in their respective videos. So we'll talk about Iron Man in the Iron Man video. You get it. But I think that the juiciest, the sweetest, the mwah, chef's kiss of all of this is that Urban was spot on when he said that he could deliver songs that Stan himself would want to take credit for. Because nearly 50 years later, Stan recalled of these cartoons. I wish I could claim to have written the lyrics because I think they're brilliant, but alas, I didn't. Ah, ah, so good. What's on my fingers? Okay, but seriously, no more side notes. Let's just watch cartoons, cause it's my job. 
Beyond our segment of time and space stands eternal Asgard, the citadel of the Norse gods, which is connected to Earth by the rainbow bridge known as Bifrost. The first episode of The Mighty Thor opens with Loki magically trapped in a tree for centuries by Thor. We have no idea what he did previously, we're just kind of jumping into the episode. Now, I enjoy this choice, actually. These are gods, after all. Their stories have been going on long before the modern setting, and I put that in air quotes because I, I do mean modern as in 1966 when this came out. But still, I like that we start with the understanding that there's some underlying beef between characters that we never got to see. It makes the whole world feel immediately rich, and you don't even have to explain much of it to the audience before we just jump right into the action. Which, now that I say that out loud, is the exact opposite of what I've been doing by immediately pausing the episode about three seconds in to talk too much before we've even gotten started. So let's, let's continue. So Loki needs someone to shed a tear near the tree, which will break the curse and set him free, which is incredibly weird, but he makes it work. I have succeeded. At last, I am free. He tracks down Thor, who's entertaining kids at a hospital, and we gotta talk about Thor's thighs. Thor's bare legs are not in really any of the promo material, but they are at least in this episode, maybe more. We'll see. Either way, it's clear that he understood the assignment of Hot Boy Summer. Skies out, thighs out, baby. Thor was here, bless his heart. He made the children so happy. Then he left. I don't know where he is now. He's gone. Loki tries to lure Thor out into the open by causing a commotion. He uses his magic to turn people into, quote, living negatives. If any of these people were named Nancy or Nellie, we'd have a pretty solid joke on our hands. Still, Thor sees this and springs to help the victims of Loki's tricks. Well, kind of. So this is the era of Thor where he had a secret identity as Donald Blake. Only when he taps his cane on the ground does he transform into the mighty Thor. Thor's origin is never explained outright in these episodes, but to the show's credit, I believe there were one minute bios of the characters before the show started to get people up to speed. I could only find the Captain America one, but there's had to have been some for the other characters that have just been lost to time. Here's what one might have looked like for Thor. The mighty Thor, god of thunder, was a fierce warrior from the mystic realm of Asgard. For centuries, he fought great battles with his trusty magic Uru hammer. But Thor's father, Odin, king of Asgard, found Thor to be too boastful in vain for a god of his stature. To humble his son, Odin sentenced Thor to live on Earth, possessing the body and mind of an incredibly boring mortal doctor named Donald Blake. Even his name is profoundly boring. Donald wanders into a cave and finds a mystical wooden cane that, when slammed upon the ground, transforms him back into the mighty Thor, wielding his trusty hammer. But, alas, Donald cannot be without the hammer for more than 60 seconds, lest he transform back into his mortal body. It's kind of like if every time Chris Hemsworth sat his hammer down, he turned into Neil Patrick Harris. That last part was probably anachronistic, but I'm sure they included something like that when the cartoon originally aired. They just aren't on these DVDs. Speaking of, though, these shows are still super hard for me to find here in America. The only reason I have this Thor DVD is because my buddy Matthew Buck from the Film Brain YouTube channel sent this to me directly from England. Hi, Scott. Yes, it turns out that for once, my Britishness did actually have a useful purpose to it for a change, so that's refreshing. You're welcome, and I'm glad they got to you safe and sound. So a huge thank you to him because he's the only good person on this planet. Please send me more of these DVDs. I have a P.O. box in the description and I want to cover the rest of these shows and Paul isn't answering my texts anymore. Back in the episode though, Donald transforms into Thor who turns the negative people back to normal and we get to meet my new favorite voice actor. The spell is over! We're normal again! What a great display of skill! Like all good Marvel villains, Loki challenges Thor to a battle in the sky. Look, he's making a carpet! My man is really putting his heart into this gig. You gotta respect it. So Loki's plan is to make Thor hypnotize himself by having the sun reflect light off his hammer into his eyes as Thor flies upwards, which is a ridiculous plan that immediately works first try. And Thor is now in a trance compelled by Loki. However, Loki is worried that something will probably break Thor out of this trance. And if that happens, then Thor would beat up Loki with his super powerful magic hammer. So. Loki's idea to prevent this is to take the hammer from Thor to make sure that if the trance does break, at the very least, 
Thor won't have his powerful weapon. You can probably already see several flaws with this plan. Obviously, Loki can't just take the hammer since it has a magic enchantment on it so that only Thor can lift it. So instead, Loki conjures up an illusory Thor and is all like, Hey Thor, yeah, what's up? Give me your hammer. No, nah, it's my hammer. No, nah, it's his hammer, actually. Yeah, that makes sense. Here you go. But then this show just acts like None of this happened. Suddenly Thor and Loki are at a zoo and Thor just leaves his hammer on the ground and Loki acts like that was the plan all along. Where did the duplicate Thor go? Why are they at a zoo? Not important. What is important is that without his hammer, Thor transforms back into Donald Blake, which does break Loki's trance. And I think that's pretty fun writing, right? Like Loki was worried about the trance breaking, so he wanted to depower Thor just in case, but depowering Thor is what broke the trance obviously sucks for Loki, but clever. Donald finds his hammer, immediately transforms back into Thor and confronts Loki who moves from a zoo to a subway station now as he pushes people onto the tracks. Good Lord. Thor saves everyone and throws Loki back to Asgard, which is amazing. And Loki reflects upon his defeat by doing a smoke ritual, which means yes, more gas. During this ritual, Loki discovers the secret of Thor's dual identity and immediately returns to Earth. Boy, it really does feel like someone on Asgard should be stopping him from leaving so easily. I'm sure this won't come up again. Loki confronts colleague and love interest of Donald Blake, Jane Foster, and he does so in a disguise, which is a decision that baffles me. We've seen Loki dress in normal human clothes before in this episode, but this time he decides to also have a big white beard? Why? I mean, it's not like Jane Foster would recognize Loki yet. Uh, even if she did, he uses some of his mind power to get past her and confront Donald Blake, which is like, okay, fine. So maybe that's why he puts on the disguise then to get close to Don and secretly attack him to steal the cane that powers him into Thor? Nope, that would make sense. Instead, Loki immediately takes off the beard, which is just some party city strap on beard. My man made an entire elusive Thor minutes ago and even conjured up a fake sea monster. I didn't show you that last part, but it did happen earlier and it was, uh, well, look, Thor, a giant sea beast attacking that small boat. <laughs> Fantastic editing. But I guess Loki's trickster god powers stop at the ability to conjure up facial hair, which yeah, I mean, I get it. It takes time. I couldn't conjure up facial hair when I first started making YouTube videos either, even though I definitely thought at the time that I could. Anyway, Loki challenges Thor to a duel in the park where he once again gets Thor to drop his hammer and transform back into Donald Blake. With cat-like speed, Loki sidesteps the mighty mallet. This time, however, he puts a magic cage around the hammer so Don can't transform transform back into Thor. Loki then spends the next day going on the chaotic rampage of a four-year-old, turning cars into ice cream and bicycles into candy. But Thor shows up in the same park and claims that he has somehow regained his powers. But how? Isn't his magic hammer trapped under a mystical force field? Well, I guess we could just lift the force field to double check that the hammer is still under there. The hammer is still there. It's not Thor, only a plastic dummy. Yeah, that's right. We get yet another phony duplicate of Thor in this same episode. Not the last time that's gonna happen either. Anyway, Thor captures Loki and sends him back to Asgard where I'm sure he will definitely stay put. I am most pleased to greet the God of Thunder once again, and I shall make certain that evil Loki escapes never more. Wait a minute. That voice of Odin sounds familiar. I really shouldn't talk about it. I, uh, okay, okay, maybe just one more side note. Side note two. Hey, I know that voice. So the actor who plays Odin in this series is Bernard Cohen, who is also the narrator for every series in this show. At the gates of Asgard, home of the Norse gods, the gallant red, white, and blue Avenger fearlessly races to the rescue. Prince Namor the first lies ill. I think this is a brilliant decision as it makes Odin seem even more powerful and in control if he's literally also the same one telling us all of these stories. I have spoken. 
probably wasn't the intention behind this casting choice, but it works. These shows use only a handful of voice actors to fill every role, which means a few people ended up playing multiple iconic characters like this throughout the series. For example, Thor here is played by Chris Wiggins, who has an impressive body of work, I'm sure, but the nostalgic part of my brain mainly recognizes them as Mr. Groundhog from Franklin. Hey, Mr. Groundhog, look, a turtle shadow. What does that mean? It means a good friend is at my door. <sighs> What a delightful show. My point is, this same voice actor for Thor Nothing can save you from the vengeance of Thor also played Hawkeye in the Cap cartoon. It's real enough to be stopped with a blast arrow. Len Carlson, who plays Loki here I have a plan, sire. Also played Quicksilver in Cap. A train. I've got to stop it. And Vita Linder, who plays Jane Foster here Thor! Look out! also played Scarlet Witch in Cap. My hex power will stop it. And look at that, we got Cap's kooky quartet right here. These three actors played even more roles in other cartoons along with some other cool voice actors. And I intend to uh, try and credit everyone as best as I can as we continue the series about these shows. I just, I don't know, just cause I think it's a fun thing to do. And I think I should probably do this retroactively since these actors will never show up in the series again. So Sandy Becker was Captain America and never played anyone else. I launched my own rocket. While Bucky Barnes was voiced by... Really? Bucky Barnes was voiced by Carl Bannas. Bannas. What a Banna's coincidence. Oh, let's get back on track. We've only covered one episode so far. So episode two opens once again with Loki, but this time he's been chained to a rock for all eternity as punishment for all the stuff he did in episode one. No word of this conversation has been missed by the God of Mischief. They'll learn I'm not called God of Evil for nothing. Okay, which one is it, man? Mischief or evil? Thor, meanwhile, is on Earth filming a movie where he fights a big sea monster. And okay, yeah, see, that makes a lot of sense. That's why the bit in the first episode felt off to me. They just took it from a different equally bonkers plotline. Unfortunately, in this episode and most of the remaining ones, Thor is wearing full length pants that cover his thighs, which sucks obviously, but there are some pretty choice camera angles regardless. Loki escapes by enchanting Thor's hammer to fly from Earth to Asgard and strike the chains that bind him, setting him free to cause mischief or evil yet again. Thor asks Odin for passage to Asgard, which he grants in the funniest way possible. Yeet. Thor searches for his hammer in an enchanted forest with deadly, violent tree monsters. And hey, wait a minute, isn't Thor supposed to transform back into Donald Blake after just 60 seconds away from his hammer? Is that, is that not gonna happen here or? No, okay, just figured I'd ask. Thor stumbles upon his old hammer and Odin learns of Loki's schemes. Return to Earth again, my son, and fear not. Loki shall be forbidden to follow. You can't make promises like that, man. You know he's just gonna escape again. Eh, maybe not in this episode though, because Loki stays in Asgard while projecting mystical powers to Sandu, a carnival psychic. Your social security number is 560141683. Now I have to edit this out. Loki grants Sandu telekinesis powers, which he uses to bury Thor under a building. I him from his hammer. My only chance. Without my mallet, my power will leave me. Oh, uh, okay, so now that rule applies. Hard to keep track. Sandu tries to levitate Thor's hammer with his mind, but strains too hard and his powers completely fail. He's thrown in jail and Loki isn't punished at all. In fact, in the very next episode, he's right by Odin's side as his aide, helping set Thor up on a date. Go thou, Loki. Permission granted. Excellent decision, Odin. Thank you for your carelessness. Loki hits up Enchantress and asks her to seduce Donald Blake to make Jane jealous. But Don isn't falling for the Enchantress. Jane, wait, it's not what you think. And that makes her ego all kinds of bruised. So the next logical course of action is to hire the Asgardian brute known as the Executioner to kill Jane Foster. Seems a little extreme. 
I'm into it. The Executioner fails at killing Jane because he's a dunce, so the Enchantress turns his arms and legs into tree branches as punishment for letting Jane go free, and holy cow, I am not a fan of this imagery at all. Thinking about this has been keeping me up at night for the past week. No thank you. No, no. Thor promptly sends both villains back to Asgard where they are carefully guarded to make sure that they can't escape or cause any more trouble. I'm kidding, I'm obviously kidding. There's no accountability on Asgard. The two are immediately back to plotting and scheming with Loki and also so is Odin, who's still super peeved that Thor is in love with Jane. Thor continues to defy me. He still loves the mortal Jane Foster. You must go to Earth and assert your authority, almighty oh, Odin. And Loki, I'm gonna need you to give me a persuasion check, please. Oof, that is not good. Uh, not that I think it'll matter, but what's your modifier? You get a plus 19 to your persuasion? Okay, we, this is why we need house rules about min-maxing. I shall do it. Loki's silver tongue convinces Odin to go to Earth and personally confront Thor about his love life. Upon his arrival, Odin is immediately jumped and there's this sincerely very funny line. Say, Mac, you got a match? My name is not Mac. And with Odin away, the god of mischief and or evil will play. I have the power I've always craved. Odin's throne. Mine! I'll never give it up! Loki's plan is now to keep Odin from returning to Asgard by unleashing Skag, a stone giant, and Surtur, the fire demon, who travel to Earth to kill Odin, and presumably Thor. Thor and his dad team up with a third Asgardian named Balder, who yells everything he says like he's fuming with rage. I fight in the name of Odin! My blade of enchanted steel has broken your club! Okay, calm down, bud. And look, I know that I was hard on the Captain America cartoon for having clunky action, but at least they tried. Here's the kind of stuff that we get with Thor. And just use your imagination, I guess. There's some father-son bonding as they defeat Skag, but Surtur is bigger trouble. Surtur is at the Arctic Circle, trying to melt the ice cap. If he does, Earth is doomed. Haha, <laughs> yeah, I love escapism. There it is again, that funny feeling. Uh, they trap Surtur in an asteroid, whatever. I want you to listen to how the music over these next few seconds are mixed because it feels like a first draft to me. A prisoner for ages to come. We have overcome both Skag and Surtur, sire. You have fared well, my warriors. And now we shall return to Asgard. My son, why do you hesitate? I cannot depart. Earth is my home. Hopefully you can tell what I mean. It's just a lot of harsh cuts and no skillful transitions between the music at all. I wish that I could get away with that level of editing, honestly. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, I know, that's that's three episodes down and only 10 more to go. Oh, good thunder god. Okay, so super quick, episode four starts with shock and surprise, Loki escaping Asgard yet again by anamorphing himself into a bee and then just flying to Earth that way. Why is nobody watching him? He gets to Earth and fights Thor like always nothing special, but this time Odin shows up and isn't pleased. What is the meaning of this? My two sons in combat without my consent? Consent is important, Odin, I agree. I order you both to do battle at Skornheim. See? Now they're allowed to fight. Loki and Thor fight in a trial in space while Loki sends Enchantress and Executioner to kill Jane Foster on Earth. Wow, that was like five names in one sentence. Balder, oh look, a sixth name, finds out about Loki's plan and informs Odin, who's taken a nice little cozy bubble bath. Balder goes to Earth to save Jane and for some reason changes into human clothes. I'm not gonna question it though, my man looks good in a suit. He and Thor rescue Jane and Odin sentences Loki to live out the rest of his immortal life in the land of the giants, but we, we just, we know he's gonna be back in like the next episode. Speaking of Loki though, you also may have noticed by now that the animators are taking panels from multiple comics and just smashing them together to create these stories. And while that works okay for the most part, the biggest challenge they have with this is that Loki's costume changes constantly, sometimes from shot to shot. It's especially apparent when his helmet goes from horns to wings and back again rapidly. <laughs> 
Loki shall be forever triumphant. I choose to believe that it's a part of the pageantry of Loki doing costume changes to make sure that people are paying attention to him. Why do I feel like there's something that I need to be paying attention to? I'm so sorry, Sparta. I promise I'll feed you in just a few minutes. We're on episode five now, and you should know the formulas for these episodes by now. Loki is at his tricks again. His punishment for the last episode was to work under a wizard who he immediately overpowers. They also refer to his punishment this time as bondage. If Loki has escaped from bondage. Which I think is very fun imagery if I keep picturing Tom Hiddleston in this role. Loki grants superpowers to a criminal called Carl Crusher Creel, who's cornered by cops. And even back then, they seem to be over militarized. Is that a bizarre? Zuka? Guy's not even wearing a shirt. Through Loki's magic, Carl can now absorb the properties of whatever he touches, turning him into the Absorbing Man. Absorbing Man, by the way, is one of my favorite Marvel villains. I don't know why, he's very silly, but I like him a whole lot. I think it's probably because Secret Wars was one of the first big Marvel stories that I read, and I know a lot of cooler stuff happens in there, like black costume and all of that, but all I remember is the Absorbing Man getting his arm cut off and having to put it back on I don't know, this is really cool. Let me gush about my childhood memories for a second. Carl is given a mission to kill Thor, who has been alerted that Loki has escaped his bondage. And I just gotta say, this show has the potential to pull from so many powerful images that Jack Kirby drew of Thor from the comics, but it continues to use this close up. From what prison do you come? Which makes the God of Thunder look like a college student wearing a low effort Halloween costume of Thor. Farewell, Prince of Evil. Thor and the Absorbing Man fight as Loki watches from a nearby building, and then the unthinkable happens. Thor just sorta lets the Absorbing Man take his magic Uru hammer. Why did I release my grip? It was but a reaction of the moment. Yeah, and now, man, I can feel the power I'm getting from. And with that almighty power, he does nothing. He just throws Thor's hammer back to him and reverts back to normal. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. The Absorbing Man puts his hand on the earth and transforms into a monstrosity composed of every atomic element. It's unclear exactly what Thor does to stop him, but I think he disrupts Absorbing Man's powers on an atomic level, which creates a violent explosion. Just as I planned, the explosion transformed all his elements into the single element, helium. So now, as a cloud of lighter than air gas, he is drifting away to pay for his crimes in the prison of endless space. Well, that feels really sad and dark. And also, Loki isn't punished at all, or he's not held in bondage at all. So I have a sneaking suspicion that we haven't heard the last. This very day, while Odin sleeps, I shall achieve my ultimate triumph. Yep, episode six, Loki's being Loki again. Now this episode might seem a little familiar to you. Loki tricks Thor into fighting an enchanted suit of armor known as the Destroyer, while the scheming god tries to seize Asgard's throne on the one day of the year when Odin needs to sleep. Yep, it's pretty much the first Thor movie. And Thor's hammer is destroyed in this one, so it's also kind of like the third Thor movie. And this episode is thrilling. It's emotionally satisfying and truly spectacular. So it's nothing like the second Thor movie. Genuinely though, this is one of the best episodes of this cartoon. As I said, Loki awakens the destroyer that's been buried on Earth for ages and goads Thor into fighting it. But Loki was unaware that Odin put a curse on the destroyer. Whoever awakens the deadly armor will be killed unless the destroyer is stopped. Basically, if Thor dies, I die too. This creates an episode that is nail biting from start to finish. The stakes feel higher than they've ever been in this show. Thor tries to fight, but his mighty hammer is shattered. He's no match for the destroyer. The only thing that would make it more tense is if we actually enforced that rule about Thor turning back into Donald whenever he didn't have his hammer. Any chance on that one coming back? No? Okay, never mind. Loki, back on Asgard, fears for his life. He knows that the only person who has the power to vanquish this fearsome foe is Odin. But the king has recently undergone his ritual slumber and cannot be awoken, and his guards won't listen to him because, I mean, 
it's Loki. Why, why would you listen to him? You've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. I never do it again. With Thor about to be killed, Loki sends all of his magic to Earth to protect his brother from the ferocious attack. It's a noble sacrifice that weakens the god of mischief and empowers Thor to miraculously defeat the destroyer. The menace will be buried beyond mortal reach forever. What a spectacular episode. Oh, and if you're wondering if Thor ever gets his hammer fixed, uh, the answer is not at all explained in this show. The next episode just starts and he has it again and it's fine. But that's not a satisfying answer. So I went to the original comics that these stories are pulled from to look up what happened. And, um, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I just, I really need to tell them it's so silly. Side note three, Steel and Uru. A couple issues after this fight with the Destroyer in Journey into Mystery 120, Thor uses magic stones to teleport to the only forge in all the nine realms where he can get his hammer fixed. Pittsburgh. Jack Kirby's use of the photo collage in the background here is clearly meant to invoke a sense of American industrialism. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania used to be the center of the American steel industry, earning the nickname the Steel City. So it would make sense that Kirby and his radiating patriotism would choose this location to represent what he believed was the greatest forge in existence. In hindsight, I kind of wish that Marvel stuck with this idea. I mean, can you imagine if in Avengers Infinity War, Thor crafted this all powerful Thanos killing Stormbreaker Axe in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In a twist of fate, however, this issue came out in 1965. And less than a decade later, the planet would face a global steel crisis where production was outpacing demand. Steel mills were driven out of business. And as of today, Pittsburgh, the once central hub of the steel industry, has no steel mills in operation within city limits. No word on if they have Uru mills though. I tried calling the mayor's office and they were no help. Now you've heard me say this word a bunch in this episode. So just in case you're not familiar, Uru is the fictional metal that Thor's hammer is made of. In fact, this early cartoon specifically refers to Thor's hammer as his magic Uru hammer and never once calls it by its proper name that we might all know, Mjolnir. My Uru hammer. My Uru hammer. Magic Uru Hammer. Uru Hammer. And I have also been doing that on purpose for this entire video so far. And that's because Marvel didn't use the name Mjolnir until many years after Thor's debut. And the reason why is hilarious. I'm sure I've told this story in a video before, but I, I need to tell it again. It's... <sighs> It's one of my favorites. When Marvel was first publishing Thor comics, Jack Kirby obviously did all of the art, but Stan Lee was too busy to devote his time to writing. So Stan passed the task off to his younger brother, Larry Lieber, who thought it would be cool if Thor's hammer had a fun name. It was clear that Larry was unfamiliar with the mythology of Thor, or else he would have known that Thor's hammer does already have a name. Nevertheless, Lieber flipped through a couple foreign language dictionaries and started sticking words and sounds together to create the word Uru as a short and simple magical sounding name for the Thunder God's weapon of choice. This whimsical word caught the attention of Marvel's then editor-in-chief Roy Thomas, you know I have a nameplate for him, who hyper-focused on this word, Uru. He couldn't get it out of his head. During the day, he would think of Uru. At night, he would dream of Uru. Uru, it must mean something. Thomas pored over books of mythology and history, trying to find something, anything that mentioned this word, Uru. I mean, why else would Lieber use this name for Thor's hammer? It had to come from somewhere. It had to be meaningful. In his tireless research, Thomas found nothing because of course he didn't. Uru was just a three letter word that Lieber made up. What words made up? What Thomas did find time and time again, however, was the name Mjolnir as the moniker of Thor's hammer. It appeared everywhere in the mythological texts that he read and nowhere in Marvel's own Thor comics. 
completely confounded, Thomas called Lieber into his office and told him about this research that, that's been devouring his attention for days. Where did the word Uru come from? Why didn't you call the hammer Mjolnir? This lack of basic research probably bothered Jack Kirby, who was a huge fan of Norse mythology, not only drawing Thor for Marvel comics, but also having drawn Thor for DC comics prior to this. But DC's Thor had a hammer called Mjolnir, so it seems like nobody got it quite right. Lieber confessed that the word Uru didn't come from anything in particular, it just sounded neat. Which is fine, but now Thomas felt like they had a problem on their hands. He felt it would be best if they started referring to Marvel's hammer by its proper name. Mjolnir. Thor and his hammer premiered in Journey into Mystery number 83. By issue number 125, the title of the book was changed simply to Thor. Ten issues after that, in Thor number 135, a whole 52 issues after the debut of Thor in Marvel Comics, the writers finally name dropped Mjolnir for the first time in the Marvel Universe. But that happened in December of 1966, just a few months after this cartoon already aired on television, which is why the cartoon never refers to it as Mjolnir. It's always Thor's magic Uru hammer. See, I think I'm making progress here. At least I didn't talk in length about a lawsuit that only vaguely ties into the cartoon like I did last time. I brought it right back to where we're supposed to be. How necessary was it for you to dive into the economy of Pittsburgh in a video about a superhero cartoon? What, at least I got to talk about you for a couple of minutes. Doesn't that grant me, like, some kind of bonus points here? It, it's the opposite. You're supposed to be writing less, not more. Okay, fine. Let's uh, let's speed run through the rest of these. I really should not have spent like 20 minutes on the first episode. Episode 7 focuses on Thor's romance with Jane Foster. Jane confesses to Thor that she loves Donald Blake. Thor is elated about this news and flies around town exclaiming to frightened strangers that a woman loves him. She loves me! Him! Us! Thor seeks out approval of his relationship with Jane from Odin, who obviously disapproves. He spent an entire episode disapproving previously. Why would it be any different now? Odin says if Thor returns to Earth to pursue love with Jane, all of his god powers will be stripped away. Loki is also here because they just don't bother locking him up anymore, and he just kind of laughs a little bit. <laughs> At last! Thor returns to Earth, and just as Odin said, his powers vanish just as the villainous Grey Gargoyle springs an attack. But Thor's got friends in high places. From Asgard, Baldur sees Thor in trouble and intervenes, firing the funniest sounding arrow. Baldur temporarily restores Thor's powers to Donald so the show can give us another visually exhausting fight sequence. In episode 8, we continue this thread of Thor desperately wanting Odin to approve of Jane. Again, I come to plead my cause. What? Thor asks his dad, if you're so worried that I'll marry a mortal, then why don't you just bestow immortality upon Jane and make her a god like us? Odin pokes Thor in disapproval. But if Jane can prove herself worthy of immortal life, then Odin would consider granting it to her. At no point in time did Thor or Odin or anyone else ask Jane if she even wanted immortal life, but whatever. Consent? The villain in this one is a guy who is obsessed with the literary story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, so he makes a potion that does the same thing. But also his potion lets him shapeshift into Thor as well. Yet another Another duplicate Thor. What a strange recurring gag. <laughs> I really hope someone out there is watching this video in double speed right now. I bet you can't even tell what I'm saying. Fake evil Thor robs a bank, which makes the confused police chase after the real Thor. Thor does immediately peacefully surrender, but the cops still shoot anyway, which is honestly a pretty realistic portrayal. Long story short, Jane inadvertently gets in the way of Thor defeating Hyde, so Odin denies granting her immortality. Again, no one asks her if she even wanted that, so this outcome is probably for the best. Consent? What? Almost done. Almost done. Episode 9 is pretty standard fare of Loki just being a scamp, although it does provide imagery that maybe Loki is Mephisto, y'all. Maybe we're all Mephisto. In episode 10, Thor travels into the future, which is rad. I love when Jack Kirby is allowed to draw future civilizations. It's always gorgeous. Thor stops a villain from blowing up a city in the 30th century with a bomb that he stole from the 20th century. Weird plan, but okay. When he returns to his time, Thor's like, You have regained your bomb and would never believe my tale. Thus, let us mention it no more. I got your sh** back. Don't talk to me about it. Bye. Once again, Odin is upset about Thor and Jane's relationship, so he reduces Thor's strength by half, and this plotline is just getting annoying at this point. Loki is all, I may never again have such a golden opportunity to destroy my enemy. And Thor is all, and Odin grants Thor all of his powers back at the last moment to save the day, as you'd expect. Episode 11 has... <sighs> 
come on. Episode 11 has Thor reveal his dual identity to Jane, and you'll never guess who's upset about that. Thor, my son has betrayed his trust. Come on. This episode does have Hercules in it, and that's really about the only notable thing. Next, episode 12. Hey, look, Hercules is still hanging around in this one. He and Thor don't get along particularly well. In Olympus, he may be a god, but on Earth, he is a fool. Thor is used to being the strongest god on Earth, but Himbolese is capturing everyone's attention these days, including filmmakers who are trying to turn Herc into a movie star. You can tell how desperately Marvel wanted their characters to break into show business because this is the second storyline in this series where heroes become movie stars. But Hercules agreed to the terms of service without reading them, inadvertently signing a contract by the villainous Pluto to rule over the underworld forever. Happens to the best of us. So naturally, Thor and Herc team up to defeat Pluto. The god of thunder, and one there is willing to risk all for Hercules. Once I called the enemy, now upon truer friend mine eyes never feasted. I love the flowery language that Stanley wrote in these comics. You can tell he was having a blast writing these old god characters. I've mentioned this in my video about how Stanley wrote comics, but he adored peppering in these kinds of sentences that would challenge young readers and make comic books feel a little bit more educational and valuable. It's also incredible when someone like Thor takes a really long time to ask a simple question like this. The lever he grips. What dread danger doth that portend? Looks like you found out pretty quick there, huh, bud? The final episode of The Mighty Thor is interesting. It's the only episode of Thor that features the Avengers. Remember them? What is up with your mask, bud? Their inclusion makes this story that would otherwise feel like a generic episode feel special. It feels big and important the way that a finale should. The villains are even a bigger threat this time around, too. A lava monster that looks like a spaghetti hulk attacks the city. He's from the Earth's core and wants to take over the planet with an army of lava monsters who look hilarious. Speaking of Spaghetti Hulk, the military is worried that these lava people might be radioactive, so they call in Bruce Banner as an expert in the field. And that is rad, because it's the first time that I've seen Bruce in all of these cartoons, and he's hot. I mean, I know he's just a series of lines on a screen, but like, some hot lines. Meanwhile, Thor confronts the lava monsters in his own way. They've got a rainbow rock that will eventually explode and kill all life on Earth's surface, allowing the lava people to claim the planet as their own. It's by far the strangest plot of any of these episodes, but it's weird in a way that doesn't let up for even a little bit, so I'm here for it. Thor challenges the King of the Lava People to a battle who doesn't particularly feel threatened. You underestimate the power of my rod! Back with Banner, Bruce gets a little too stressed about the explodey rock and transforms into the Incredible Hulk. Rick Jones, who is also here for some reason, tries to use this to their advantage by aiming the Hulk to destroy the Rainbow Stone. Hulk, listen to me. The whole Earth will blow up if you don't help. Good. Don't you understand? We'll all be killed. Good. Nah, Hulk throws Pride Rock into space and Thor hits it with a hammer. It explodes and the world is safe. The lava men have fled. The danger is past. I have spoken. You can say that again, Thunder God. And that's it. That's the swan song of this series. This whole ordeal takes place on Earth, so we don't get to see Asgard at all, or any of the characters from that realm in this final outing. Is Odin still disapproving somewhere? Is Baldur still shouting into the void? Where, oh where, is our dear Loki? Unclear. My recommendation, just watch episode six of this show. It has a thrilling story that perfectly encapsulates this cartoon, with captivating action, the fun Asgardian characters that we love, and hard-hitting emotional drama. If Thor dies, I die too! Good! But that's the mighty Thor. I had a fun time with this one. I still think I like Captain America more, but this is a close second place. So far. We've still got Iron Man, Hulk, and Namor to go, and I'm also going to throw in uh, Spider-Man into the mix as well, because that show feels spiritually tied to all of these. But please, dear God, send me these DVDs so I can actually review the rest of them. I mean... You gotta love the timing of this, right as I am just finishing up talking about Thor. 
it starts thunderstorming, you know? No better way to end it. Uh, but I am done, so can I go feed my cats now? Actually, I knew you were gonna run long, so I just fed your cats myself like a half an hour ago while you recapped the first episode. Yeah, I've been talking to Kevin Feig about a Mjolnir movie. I mean, if they can kill Loki off and give him his own show, I don't see why they can't bring me back, you know? I think it would be more character-focused, not too much action. I'm more than a weapon, I, I think it would be nice to explore that side of me. Wow, it is revolting to watch you eat. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to all of these rad folks for providing their voices for this video. Their channels will be linked below. Uh, and also, for the record, Sparta is a well-fed cat. I just wanted to use him in a video again because you all love seeing him pop up. He's a good sport. He's also a part of this NerdSync sticker pack that you can get over at NerdSyncStore.com. These were designed by Smash Tunes, and they are super cute, uh, including this Thor-inspired one that says you are worthy. And hey, if you liked this video, subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss an upload. I also try to upload videos early for patrons, for people who uh, support me over on Patreon. You can also get your name listed here on this screen, just like Eric Ketchum, Christopher Lang, Jonathan Lewinowski, Donna Bark, Amanda Trisdale, Caleb Brock, David Arroyo, uh, De, De Cassowary, I'm so bad at pronouncing names, Edwin Latour, Eric Totoropato, Everett Parrot, Havelox Niggles, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, LT O'Brien, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who keep this channel going over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. If I hit 700 patrons, I will make a video about my favorite movie ever, Scott Pilgrim. Uh, if that interests you, the link is in the description along with everything else that I've talked about. Go check it out. If you missed the first video in this series about the Captain America cartoon, click or tap right here to watch that. Or here's probably my best video ever where I talk about Thor's entire emotional journey through the MCU and how it impacted me personally. Until next time, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. What?